Okay, this lesson for the Cornet Project class concerns the reality that all the scriptures speak concerning Christ Jesus. So often we are entangled by constructs which have gone beyond the scope of their, I suppose, a mental model, perhaps scaffolding, perhaps a low entry, low threshold of entry for someone who steps in. For example, you can almost, uh, by open attribution, just appropriate construct Calvinism almost instantaneously, if you can remember TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And then as people argue against you, they'll teach you more about it than you would even have to know. And they won't even notice that you don't know much content. You just have appropriated construct. Now that was not the intention, I'm certain, as people began to formulate, try to systematize uh, belief systems or, or the large amount of data we call the scriptures. However, what's happened since it's gone beyond the scope, uh, to keep it interesting, people have had to go beyond, uh, for example, the construct. So they have a hyper expression of Calvinism or a, a varied, multivariate expressions of Lutheranism uh, or Arminianism as it's always changing. And Anglicanism, which I don't know, certainly uh, much about their content. And then, of course, Molinism, which is from Molina, and then Pelagianism, which is from Pelagius. So all those constructs point to the ones around whom they're centered. So constructs aren't scriptures, and scriptures point to Christ. So let's look at that as those of you now who are studying the languages, and you're noticing uh, my goodness, with the etymology of words, with the context, syntax, with the languages, biblical Hebrew, the inflectional morphemes, the fact that the Hebrew, for example, is pictographic, numeric, and phonetic, uh, the highly inflected Koine Greek, you're thinking, why bother with constructs? Well, that's because so few people will so interact so closely with the text. And again, uh, in my profession of being a consultant, Project creep uh, is always a peril, uh, a danger, a risk, because projects can become so far removed. For example, the late R.C. Sproul was explaining the TULIP doctrine, but he was going uh, beyond it by taking the T, total depravity, and then he was defining that as radical corruption. He took unconditional election and moved away from the text and even away from that construct calling it sovereign grace. So he was moving further and further away. That's called accretion, where you just continue to add and add and add. And now the jargon is undefined. For example, you can't find two people who could uh, agree upon the definition of the word depravity in the expression total hereditary depravity. That's a conclusion, a construct. And then the implications, uh, people are... Uh, typically, they have to be walked through it so that when you have a protasis, if total hereditary depravity is true, then man is unable to believe, for example. Well, again, we just continue to find ourselves moving further and further from the text. But if, if the constructs don't point a person to Christ, and they don't, and they don't point to Christ or speak of him, then you can see why the scriptures are so much better. So we'll just look at an example in Luke 24, 27, and I'll be more uh, quickly uh, move along. But it says, and when he began, that's an aorist participle. So uh, when, when he began, and you can see from RK, so you have and when he began away from, or we might say ever since. But you notice it's apo away from Moses. Now, obviously, that's Moses because we can see the transliteration to Moses and away from all of the prophets. Now, that's a transliteration also. See the P the R, the O, the PH, 
and there we go, the prophets. Now this 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 is a this is only one letter that changes things. If you notice, if there were a sigma there, then that would be aorist. But without it, this is imperfect. So now we notice in the TR, it's lacking that sigma. So we have the word thoroughly, and then we have that transliteration, hermeneutics, where we get the word hermeneutics. So he was, uh, he was, so when he began, it tells us from the beginning, when he began away from Moses and away from all of the prophets, he was thoroughly, thoroughly interpreting. Yeah, they're going thoroughly interpreting for them. And in interpreting, we're looking at explaining for them in all the scriptures. See the graphe, the scriptures. The things. And this is concerning. You remember that preposition? It's a circle. Like when someone talks about perimeter, around, the things concerning him or himself. There. Now, so the scriptures do that. So when you can, you have the tools, let's say the languages, Greek and Hebrew, the grammar, the syntax, and then, of course, you move to hermeneutics, which is context. You have a, uh, as we were trained in systematic theology, a categorical approach, meaning use the Bible categories. Those are the terms that are found in the lexicon. We were admonished and always reminded to have lexical support, meaning we have enough words in the lexicons uh, to use that to actually communicate what the Bible has to say. Now, since that's true and we have this, you remember we had demonstrated before that in the first word, uh, just be patient for a second here, in the first word of the Bible, we had that word and uh, Barashith, Bere, oh, I misspelled it. That's always a problem when you're doing a class. I, 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 Hebrew is right to left and it's, it's uh, sometimes it's not the language I speak. So here we go. There we go. And I use this block style because the children at my wife's church there where I pastor, they write and use it. And again, my habit of rash there, it's just a longer form. But we remembered that this first word, vire sheath, vire sheath in beginning, there's prince or head, there's son, there's the letter for God. There's uh, violence, hand, and this symbol is crossed sticks, remember? So now we have um, the prince, the head of the house, the prince of the house, the son of God, the prince, that's Jesus Christ, at the hand of violence was crucified. And then we have the very next thing, the very word itself, and I'll write it in block there. That's a longer uh, form there, this block style. We have bara, which is that word. Yeah. So that's the first three letters in the first word of the first chapter of the Bible is the Son of God, hand of violence, crucified. And then the very word create, bara, and this is how you bow point it. For those of you that will study that eventually, bara uh, created. So. Uh, the very first word, the very first book, the very first chapter, we have in it that which speaks of Christ. And then, of course, we know that as the lamb slain ever since the downcast of order, we know that when Adam disobeyed, it was about what happened to Christ. He became the one slain. And then we noticed that they were clothed in animal skins, lamb skins. We know that from the context. Then we know immediately 
in the birth of Cain, the firstborn, she said, I received a child from the Lord. Well, then Abel was a keeper of sheep. So we have Abel as a shepherd of sheep who provided the sin offering. God told Cain, the sin offerings there at your door, crouching there, it was favorably disposed. It says in the King James English, his desire will be for you. I mean, he's not running. He's not, Cain didn't have to chase the sheep, the sin offering. And his brother Abel had, as a shepherd, made provision of that sheep. So Jesus um, is the one that we think of as the one God provided. Abraham offered his son Isaac, and Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? And he said, the Lord will provide. Uh, Abel was a provisionist, a tender, uh, uh, that is one who tended the sheep, a shepherd. We can't help but in all of that, now Adam had to behold and notice what he did that caused the Son of God to be a lamb slain by his disobedience. It wasn't about Adam's fall. It was about Christ's slaughter and the execution of the lamb. So now we have Adam having to watch in horror that his son is now the murderer of his son, Abel. And Abel lost his life because he was faithful to provide a sin offering for his brother. And in that faithfulness to do so, uh, Cain, who was rejected because he didn't respect what was provided for him through the labor and the toil of Abel. And God told him, he said, you'll have, you can have power over this. Just take that sin offering, go and sacrifice that. And then Cain asked, am I my brother's keeper? Well, that wasn't the same word as keeping sheep. And certainly it includes a guardianship, but it referred to adherence. So not only do we have the scripture speaking of Jesus, and showing us from the very first word in the book of Moses, the very first word, the very first chapter of the very first book of Moses, we have the Son of God at hand of violence crucified. We have the word create. Uh, Bara is Son of God. We know in Romans the Creator is revealed. That's Jesus is the Creator through whom, apart from whom, and without whom was nothing, uh, nothing came to be that ever came to be. So, and then we have these accounts as we go through this, and we can only think, uh, recall, and have aroused in us the truth about Christ through the scriptures. Thus, the faith we practice at the, at the New Covenant community that we are uh, at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, for example, in Jacksonville, Arkansas, uh, people are fathered through the gospel, which the gospel's first. A person believes they're fathered through the gospel. So the gospel preached that those who trust in Jesus Christ have everlasting life is the one through which one is fathered. So one believes, find out verb. That's because the text doesn't allow it to ever become about us. There's one elect one, Christ Jesus, Isaiah 42. He's the only one that was ever born able and willing to fulfill the law. And he's the only one that pleased the father. So he's the only one whose death atone for all the sins and his blood is for those who are fathered out from God, the kinsmen. And so his blood is, the atonement is for sins. That's Christ's blood. The uh, redemption is kinsmen. That's Christ's blood. He purchased those fathered out from God, his father. And of course, then the, uh, he then is entrusted with those fathered out from God, his father, and he is the one that saves, delivers, and sheep herds us all through our life. So everything from Genesis to the last book in the Bible is about Christ. So we now see all of this. And of course, uh, what we do is those fathered through the gospel, then we baptize them into Christ. That is the ecclesia. They were baptized into Moses, that congregation in the wilderness. That's all it assures that it can only be about Christ Jesus. And then, of course, our fellowships into the gospel, that message again, which is only about Jesus. And then the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread, the self-examination, the self-correction, which recalls Jesus' words to us to pluck out our own eyes, sever our own hand, and remove our own feet, not to go and do that to another, but to first do it to ourselves. And that's quite a remarkable turn uh, in, in a correct interpretation of the uh, responsibility of an adherent to that which is prescribed for the sake of oneself and for the sake of others. 
And so, so let me see, we preach the gospel, someone believes and trusts Jesus for everlasting life, they're fathered through the gospel, then we baptize them into Christ, that is the ecclesia, we then fellowship them into the gospel, and then we teach them, grow them upwardly, so that they will be competent, bear their own responsibilities, self-examine, examine themselves to assure they're in the faith, no social status at the foot of the cross, for example, no uh, denominationalism, no theistic traditions or orders, uh, no social uh, ranks or hierarchies. As Jesus said, they love to sit in the upper seats. They love to stand on a street corner so everyone can hear them and their long prayers. They love to blow a horn before they give an offering. So none of that. And then self-correct and then eat the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. And of course, then take that gospel into all the world. And that's how we disciple others by growing them in the grace and the knowledge, and we uh, see all of that. So it, it sounds too simplistic, but it, actually it's quite um, advanced. It's quite superlative. It's quite ultimate that we have Jesus in his interpretation. His process was to demonstrate him, uh, all the scriptures, the things concerning him. So, uh, for example, and this is really one of the easier things when you start studying the pictographic, do the numerics. We have another video where I showed you that the 28 letters in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, 28 letters, seven words. You take the product of one, multiply it by the product of the other, and you have the number, the value of pi, correct to five digits. John chapter one, verse one, for example, the same thing. You have the value of the number E. And so these things are remarkable in their precision and how advanced they are in proving irrefutably uh, the intelligent design of the scriptures, the intention of that script, these scriptures and how they were designed and formatted and arranged in the Bible for us to uh, notice him. So you have a blessed day and enjoy this lesson.